we have come to an incredibly swift and surprising ending in Pariah Nexus. To me, it seemed like with the first two episodes, we were settling in for the long haul, but apparently the third one is the conclusion. And what a conclusion it was. We have to figure out what happens with Sakan and Danica, so let's break it down. There is no peace amongst the stars, for in the grim, dark future, there is only war. At the end of episode 2, we left off with our space marine, Sakan of the Salamanders, and our sister of battle, Danica from the Order of Our Martyred Lady, protecting some citizens from this planet. Now though they don't agree on what to do with the citizens, they still are allies. So when they're attacked by the Death Mark, they snap into battle mode, and this is where we start our third episode. This time we get to see Sakan and Danica's interaction through the eyes of the Death Mark and it does not take this Necron a long time to engage the Imperial survivors. As he's shooting beams of green energy at the Imperials, he's interrupted by Zerus, his commander. Impatient as ever, he's wondering what is taking the Deathmark so long with getting rid of the Imperial survivors and the threat to his experiments. And ironically, the conversation between the Deathmark and Zerus is interrupted by some of these shambling Imperial citizens who've been experimented on by Zerus. The insane soldiers and citizens swarm over the Death Mark before he can go into his teleportation matrix. He cuts many of them down, but he's unable to escape the tide of the rambling humans. With the threat of the Death Mark now passed, Sakan and Danica turn to their charges. Danica is still very suspicious of them and treats them as though they were the cause of the downfall of the planet, while Sakan offers them a glimmer of hope, telling them that there's an evacuation locus not far to the west. And this is where Sakan and Danica yet again butt heads. For all intents and purposes, this mission in trying to protect these civilians is useless to her. They've already failed and the planet is already lost. She doesn't quite understand why an angel of death is so enamored with protecting citizens. Not only bodily, but also their mental health and morale. As Danica stomps angrily away from Sakan, she's met again by her Katie inspector, Audra. The soldier, who's a suspected figment of Danica's imagination, once again confronts the sister about her treatment of the civilians and her true motives. But it is very clear that Danica no longer wants to hear or heed the soldier's counsel. We then cut to the death mark. Though still alive after his confrontation with the humans, he is a wreck. His neck and limbs are bent at unnatural angles, and green energy seeps sickly from all of his wounds. But like every Necron, he has reanimation and rebuilding protocols in his programming, and his body swiftly comes back together in a relatively operational state. The one noticeable thing that isn't fixed, however, is his teleportation matrix. But he can still hunt and track, and he shambles into the sunset still looking for his quarry. We cut back to our human survivors as they head towards the evacuation locus. Trailing near the back of this group is the sister and the ecclesiarchal priest. They talk about the fall of their world, paradise, and the religious ramifications of it. Hoping to give the sister some type of comfort, the preacher offers the God Emperor's forgiveness for her and her sister's failures. And these are the words that truly make Danica snap. She whirls around at the preacher, hefting her bolter at him and exclaiming that he knows nothing about failure or faith. How could he talk to her about failure when he didn't pick up a weapon to defend his own world? As the specter of Audra tries to calm the sister down, Danica starts having flashbacks about the beginning of this war. Necrons advance on an imperial position held by the sisters and Cadians. Under the relentless march of these living robots, the Imperium is falling. We finally get to see Audra alive during this time as she tells the sister that they need to fall back. Necron destroyers break through the lines and start slaughtering everyone, including Audra, right in front of Danica. Pulled back into the current moment and completely distraught at her own memories, Danica aims the bolter at the preacher and fires. Further ahead, the situation with Sakan and the other survivors is not much better. They have indeed reached the evacuation locus, but it is in ruins. There isn't a human alive in sight and the entire landing pad is destroyed. And not only that, a Necron destroyer scuttles out of the wreckage and looks directly at the survivors. Donning his helm and yelling the salamander war cry, Sakan engages the destroyer. We cut back to Danica as she finally starts to calm down. We see that her shot very narrowly missed the preacher. Now whether that was on purpose or on accident, we don't really know. 
But realizing the state of mind that she's in and how she has acted towards these people, she asks the preacher for forgiveness. But before the preacher can respond, they hear bolter shots and she rushes off to help Sakan. The salamander is in a lot of trouble. A piece of his helmet right over the eye is gone, and as he engages the destroyer, he even loses his right arm. Before the destroyer can sink his hyperphase sword into Sakan's body, he's hit from the side by bolter shots. Danica has made it just in time for Sakan to get his bearings, find a new weapon, and re-engage. Working in tandem, they are finally able to take down the destroyer, and as Sakan raises his chain sword above the alien's head, he proclaims that the galaxy is humanity's. The light in the Necron destroyer's eyes slowly goes out, and as Sakan pulls his chain blade free from the body, he falls over in exhaustion. After seeing Sakan's body next to the Necrons unmoving, Danica heads back to the survivors. After seeing such incredible sacrifice from the Salamander, she is resolved to protect these people. Her former hatred is washed away, and she is resolved in her faith once again. And it's at that moment when the Death Mark shows up. Green energy lights up Danica's back, and her face contorts in pain and shock. She falls face first into the dirt of her fallen world, and the Death Mark looms over her. Her last words before her death are simply, I hear an angel. Moving faster than anything that big should be able to, Sakan comes out of nowhere with a combat blade in hand. Dodging beams of green energy, he's able to sink his combat blade into the death mark. But unfortunately, with only one hand, the death mark is able to escape Sakan and goes into a teleportation matrix. Sakan finds the survivors and is relieved to see they're still alive. Telling them that the Emperor still has more for him to do, he sends them off further west in search of another evacuation point. With a renewed sense of determination, they flash the sign of the Aquila as Sakan marches off into the gloom with a combat blade in hand. We next see Zerus in his laboratory as a scarab with the hololithic image of the Deathmark comes up to him. Looking badly damaged, the Deathmark asks Zerus for rejuvenation and repair in order to continue his mission. Zerus sees this as a failure, but before they can continue their conversation, Sakan's arm comes out of nowhere, wrapping around the Deathmark's neck and dispatching the Necron. Slowly, the glowing green image of Sakan comes into view, with a scowl on his face and a curse for the alien on his lips. Zerus asks the Salamander why are they so determined to defend a planet that is so obviously lost. And Sakan counters with his own question, what makes the alien so arrogant to think that his brothers will not come for retribution? Finally, the scene cuts to a group of Cadian troopers in a forest. This apparently is still on Paradise, and they are patrolling this area, killing any of Zerus's human experiments that they find. The lights on their guns flash towards a small figure wandering through the woods. We see Atia, one of the survivors that Sakan had protected in the city. Mumbling about a lost family and Sakan, she turns to the troopers. She looks up at them with the question, Am I safe now? Over the soldier's vox, you hear an officer say, Do it. And as the screen cuts to black, all you hear is a las gun shot going off. And that is the end of Pariah Nexus. Alright, there is clearly a lot to unpack in this episode. And I think for maybe the first time since I've been reviewing this series, I have more negatives than positives. So let's just jump right into it. My first and overwhelming problem is the fact that this was three episodes. And honestly, I would not have minded it being this short if the third episode did not feel so rushed. And not only did it feel like they rushed the story, but it felt like they wrapped up a lot of storylines by just killing characters. Which I understand, this is a grimdark future, bad things are going to happen to people all over the Imperium. But it seemed like a wasted story. I know Games Workshop is still relatively new to the TV show business and is getting more into it with the Amazon show. But I think one thing that they're really going to have to learn and kind of cater to fans for is satisfying storylines. If I go through multiple episodes, even multiple seasons of a character's growth and that is useless in the end, I feel like I've wasted my time. I'm not even saying that everyone has to survive this ordeal in order to be a satisfying story. But let's take Danica for instance. She was the main character, she had the most screen time and probably the most growth as a character. And not only that, but other storylines and other parts of the world are tied to her character. Everything from the destruction of the world itself, the survivors, and her specter, Audra. 
And all of these things are working towards putting her character in a place to where she renews her faith and is once again there to protect civilians and the Imperium. And as soon as that realization finally breaks through in her mind, she's killed. A completely unsatisfying story where we don't even get to see the fruits of her character growth. Tied to this qualm is a lesser one. Obviously, Ultramarines have been the poster boys for Space Marines forever, and I'm super glad that we decided to focus on Salamanders this time. But even then, why is it that the only person who gets any other type of growth, or any type of development, and any type of future is the Space Marine? It seemed like the show was breaking out of a lot of the tropes that Warhammer falls into, and then completely destroyed that attempt at the end. My second big issue with this story is the fact that the Pariah Nexus is not talked about at all. In fact, the only Necron information we get, or interaction that we get, is Zerus yelling at the Deathmark. We didn't get to learn anything about his experiments, we didn't get to learn anything about the Pariah Nexus, we didn't get to learn anything about his connection to the Pariah Nexus. A better title for this would have been Sakan's Walk Through Paradise. Now, I don't know if they're doing multiple seasons of this show that hasn't really been specified, so I'm just going off of what we have. And the last qualm I have is really a personal one. It doesn't have anything to do with the quality of Games Workshop's writing here. But why they have to shoot little Ati at the end? Look, I read a ton of Warhammer books, like I've stated before, and I know that civilians do not last long in those books. But the writers really said if they leave any type of Imperial protection, they're done for. I would have at least liked to see what happened to the rest of the group. Were they taken out by the soldiers patrolling the woods, or were they attacked again by the Necrons? But in the span of a minute, they told us that the rest of the group was gone, and Atia was taken out. Again, this is where that kind of rushed feeling comes in. Now, all that being said, I still enjoyed Pariah Nexus overall. And I think that enjoyment comes from the fact that it is fun to watch, uh, along with the fact that there is a kind of low bar when it comes to Warhammer animations. We don't have a lot out there to compare it to. But I'll still probably watch it again sometime this week and later in the future too. One fantastic thing about this show, however, is its sound design. It is some of the best sound design in an animated show that I've seen in a while. Movements from heavier characters like Sakan and Danica because they're wearing power armor make sense and are impactful. Though I'm not 100% satisfied with the sound of the bolter in this show, it is still very good. The music and sounds of battle are not overwhelming and they're incredibly detailed. So a huge shout out to the production team there. Now before we head out, let's talk the future of Pariah Nexus. I'm hoping and praying that this is a prologue season 1. Sakan is on a mission to go and find Zerus, so I'd love to see that storyline advance. We need more development from the Necrons in general. What are they doing? Why are they doing it? What is their goal and where are they headed? And lastly is the fate of Paradise. Will Sakan link back up with any other Imperial forces? Will we see other Space Marine chapters? These are the questions that I need answered if we're going to get a Season 2. But what do you all think? Did you enjoy Pariah Nexus overall? Was there not enough for you? Was it just right in length of story? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you guys always for watching. Leave a like, hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next one.